Yeah, um, you know when I was preparing uh, for this talk, it, uh, because of my education it was quite philological, and uh, by the days as they went by I figured that uh, maybe the more technical stuff is cut out, or to be cut out, yeah, um, and that basically ended up in uh, the erasal of the entire paper and the rewriting of a new one. Um, so that is what I'm trying now is um, basically to give uh, my philological research a little bit of a modern twist uh, to adhere to the um, yeah to the uh, whole idea of the conference, which is Vajrayana and modernity. Yes. Um, Okay, uh, we are just getting right into it, yeah? Yenaiva vishakandena mriyante sarva jantavach tenaiva vishatatvagnyo vishena spotayet visham. Yena yena hi badyante jantavo raudra karmana sopa yena tu tenaiva mutyante bava bandanat ragena vatyate loko ragenaiva vi mutyate vipadita bavana fyesha Magnata Buddha Tirtikai. Um, that means something like um, people can be killed by a particular kind of poison, but the person knowing uh, the nature of the poison may dispel the poison by just that bit. Um, people are bound to samsara by the most terrifying karma, uh, but they can be leased from the fetters of just samsara by taking it as a means. People are bound by passion and they are released by that very passion. Those um, who do not know that, let's say, viparita uh, bhavana, this kind of counterintuitive practice, uh, these are uh, the Buddha Tirtikas, or let's say the Buddha Tirtikas, they do not know that, that is to say the outsiders don't know that. Um, so this is a quote from the second kalpa, the second patala of the uh, second kalpa of the Hevasra Tantra, three verses. Um, and they are coming from a patala which is called Dakini Jala Samvare Siddhi Nirnaya. Um, you will, I will get to, I mean, I will come back to why this is relevant, okay, in, in just a moment, yeah. Um, you know, the conclusion comes in the end, so to speak. Yeah, this is just the preparation, okay? And maybe a uh, small side remark. Um, it is interesting, the name of the second patala of this Seva Shira Tantra, Dakini Jala Sambare. Better should be Shambara, actually, because it is about bliss and not so much about uh, vows, yeah? It is, you know, Sa, Sha, Sa, they always get mixed up, you know, so it's all the same anyway, but uh, the translation Demchok is certainly for Shambara, and actually in the oldest source of... Uh, or let's say the oldest yoga tantra, which was later called the Yogini Tantra, the Dakini Jala Sambara, yeah, Savabura Samma Yoga, the Dakini Jala Sambara, uh, the full name, yeah. Uh, there it's actually made very clear that the Upasarga Sam is supposed to be understood as Sham in the sense of bliss, yeah. It is uh, written in Savabura Samma Yoga 110, just the opening section. So come Sham Iti Vi Pya Tam, Sarva Bhaudam Mahasukam, yeah. So the Sham is to be understood in the sense of Sukham, which is denoting the great bliss re, uh, that belongs to all the Buddhas. Yeah? And again, I will come back to that in just a second. Okay? So, um, when we talk about Dohas and uh, Charyas, there is a couple of things that I should try to briefly um, introduce. So Dohas, as you might know or not know, there is a kind of a poetic expressions that is attributed to the siddhas in which they display their uh, awakening in a form of, let's say, a kind of uh, poetic art language that is often called Apabramsha. Some people say it's the language of the Dakinis, you know, it's some kind of mixture of Sanskrit, uh, Old Bengali or Older Bengali, Prakrits in general. There is elements also, of course, uh, of a few other vernaculars in there. Uh, but the main point here is that they express themselves in a, let's say, a very poetic way, a little bit like Esperanto, you know, or Pali. Yeah? It's not really a, a spoken language, it is a language that is specifically designed in order to convey a particular kind of message in a rather skillful way. Yeah? And um, so there is two things that are important when talking about the Doha. So for the one hand, they are the expressions of the Druptops, the Mahasiddhas. Yeah? 
and how do they express themselves? Usually in an unconventional manner, and this is why charya is very important. Yeah, um, this is uh, I would translate as a tantric conduct. Okay, so it is not merely a performance, uh, but it is more like let's say expressing your own sanity by showing that you are beyond certain cultural uh, normative dogmas and social roots. Yeah, okay. And um, so, and then the second part of this is, of course, this can be provocative, it can be, uh, let's say, a uh, little bit confusing, yeah, it can uh, create certain disturbing emotions in people, and uh, it is not merely for the sake of provoking, but it's using it as a means in order to display, yeah, a certain kind of uh, realization. So this is one part of the doors. The second is that they also talk about how they get there, yeah, and there we come to the point where what usually is being called uh, Chandali, yeah, Utpanakrama practices, in general completion stage practices, sexual yoga, call it however what you want, yeah, but somewhat working uh, with your energies in order to get to that point where you express themselves in this, let's say, non-dual way, yeah? So this is the second part that is uh, really important here, and it always has been therefore strongly connected with what in Tibetan became known as Tulshuk or Nyanpa. Yeah, so the conduct of the divine madmans, right? Uh, Unmatavrata in Sanskrit, yeah, or Unmatavrata Charya, yeah. So, um, which would be more or less the literal, uh, or wh where of Tulshok is just the literal translation, yeah. Good, and I'm now I'm going to talk a little bit about um, something that I found actually interesting. Again, you know, bear with me. The twist comes in the end. It will somehow fall together. I hope. You know, I've been told that. Uh, when you understood the topic, you can make it uh, simple and bring it together in a coherent way. Let's see if I've managed. You know, I, I'm not so certain about that. We will see about the outcome in the end, right? Uh, so this uh, one of the most famous dohas in Indian literature is certainly that uh, of Kanha or Krishna Charya, yeah, uh, the one of the two uh, older Krishnas, Nagpur Chippa, yeah, uh, in uh, in Tibetan. And I date him, let's say, into the late eighth, beginning uh, late eighth, beginning of the ninth century. Um, probably I shouldn't go into why why I do that. That will take too much time. But basically, you know, because of his teaching, the way uh, of how the upper Brahmsha is used, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So and um, his text pretty much represents this archetype um, of which I was trying to paraphrase before. Yeah? So there he is displaying this Charya conduct and he is like giving very clear references to, uh, uh, to Chandali as the means to, uh, uh, that expresses that kind of conduct and is the same time the means through which he gained uh, Siddhi or Mahamudra Siddhi. Yeah? So and then in the 12th century uh, we have a very nice little uh, commentary on, uh, on, on his Doha which is called Doha Koshatika. Yeah? pretty straightforward, okay, by a guy called Amrita Vachala, and what he now did is that he basically interpreted something that is very nicely, you know, being to be interpreted by practices we know from He Vachala and the Samputa traditions, you know, like Chandali, the Four Joys, then afterwards Prabhasvara, Usa, Clear Light, and so on and so forth. So he, um, he this Amrita Vachala, he interpreted uh, that Doha uh, along the lines of the Kala Chakra doctrine. Yeah, means Shatanga Yoga, which is a very distinct uh, way of uh, practicing uh, the Utpanakrama. Yeah, so it really rearranges what we know from Narutrukrut or Nigutrukrut. Uh, it really transforms that and really, you know, uses the elements in a very distinct way uh, that really you you cannot really fit them on top of each other so easily. Yeah, and this is really like two two distinct systems, and you can very easily see um, that. He is interpreting it according to um, Kala Chakra by the sources that he uses, not only the language that he uses. Yeah? So he uses Sekodesha the Tika, the Lagutantra Tika, the Vimala Prabha Tika. He uses various sources from the Aya school of Gukhya Samaja that are all found in Naropa's uh, Sekodesha Tika, so that's certainly not accidental. Yeah? And um, interesting here is that all of the other doors and their commentaries, including that of Munidatta, the famous collection Chaya Kosha Gitika Ritinama by uh, Munidatta, that you are going to talk about, I think, yeah? um, that they use, um, that they do not use uh, such interpretation. That's very, very clear, that they stick to uh, the Chandali practice as it is taught in the Hevachra according to the Four Joys. Yeah? That is very, very clear. In almost every poem there is a 
uh, almost every comment to every of these Charya Gitis, there is a very clear reference to these practices. And the same we find in the commentary to Sarahas Doha and as well that that is ascribed to Tilopa. Yeah, it's all very clear. And they are all citing uh, exactly these verses that I was citing before yeah, in their commentaries because this is a, a very distinct feature of that. Yeah? So, Amrita Vajra doesn't do that. Hmm? Instead, okay, basic, yeah. Instead, he, yeah, like I said, he uh, interprets everything according to Shatanga Yoga and he mentions that uh, term three times um, and every time uh, he mentions it um, he mentions it in the context of prana, or more precisely pranayama, that is to say uh, restraint of breath, yeah, uh, breathing techniques. And he only mentions the first three of the six angas, not the last three. So and that is of course slightly surprising if somebody promises to you to interpret something along the lines of Shadanga Yoga, which he obviously doesn't do. So, um, I now show you a couple of uh, examples uh, to elucidate why I find that all like slightly uh, strange what he does in this commentary. Yeah? So, uh, first example where he mentions it, uh, just to, you know, prove uh, that what I just uh, claimed is more or less correct. Yeah? So, so, difficult to hold, or the bearer of the world, uh, uh, it's difficult to hold. That's more or less what it says. Yeah? And it says um, that the bodhicitta is to be made firm by uh, binding the breast through the Shatanga Yoga, and that is difficult, Dubhena. And that is difficult to be done. Where? Asmin, inside, there, that is to say, in the channel. Yeah? And that is the meaning of difficult to hold. The next example uh, shows you the same. It's again about Pranayama, Shatanga Prayogena, Chandra Surya Nirodena. Pranastiri karanam pandanam. So the binding, um, uh, the binding that is making firm the prana uh, through the cessation of sun and moon, that is to say the left and right channel, lalana and rasana, yeah, uh, that is being done by means of the Shatanga Yoga. Again, very clear reference. And in the 33rd stanza, uh, basically the same, making from the mind through the Shatanga Yoga, um, um, then you are in the proximity of the Dharma Akshara, the Anahata, which is for him a little bit surprisingly, he defines that uh, before, uh, not in the heart, uh, but in the head. He, uh, he calls it the uh, Hamsa, yeah? Ham Hamkara, yeah? which is a very clear reference uh, that it must be in the head. So it is also slightly surprising that he actually uses this terminology. So it's all a little bit up and down, yeah? you may say. So um, I will not read it all out, yeah? maybe um, just the translation. So this is the commentary from the Chaya Kosha Gitika Vrittinama. Um, Munidatta's commentary, and I translated just one part uh, to give you an example. So here he cites uh, a stanza of Krishna Charya's Doha, and it says something like, uh, when the door of the moving wind has given a firm lock, in this frightening darkness the mind becomes a lamp, and when the jewel of the, yeah, of the, uh, of the victorious one um, embraces the sky, then Tanha says, even while enjoying existences, that is to say, samsara, you can attain, uh, or you can obtain accomplishment. And you see, like this reference, uh, or this line even, you can take as a very, very short paraphrase of the practice of Chandali itself. And this is also basically exactly how Munidatta explains it, yeah? uh, which is what we expect. So he says, um, First, the best of yogins, once having made firm the Vajra body, that is the subtle body, yeah, the Vajrakaya, by means of former practice of the individual deity, having divided the house's parts of moon and sun, yeah, the side channels, uh, through the instructions of Vajra speech, the Vajra japa, having made firm the Vajra speech, she, whose nature is the central channel, the avadutika, in the joy of cessation, that means after the Vidamananda, so that means that afterwards, uh, Vajra Japa and Prabhaswara is coming, so a very clear reference to the culmination of the practice. Yes? Um, uh, leading to the peak of Mount Sumeru, that is to say the Mahatsuka Chakra, which is the breathing in and out by the cultivation of the single inner joy in order to make firm the Vajra mind. So that is a very, very clear reference and is exactly what we expect. Yeah? Um, yeah, for some reason, um, Amrita Vajra, uh, he uh, gives a very lengthy explanation with uh, several quotes of the Kala Chakra and says that is uh, a process that he divides by Kaya Banda, Bhag Banda and Chita Banda. Hmm? 
so the fixation of body, speech and mind, um, which is pretty much uh, not what we expect. And it is also somewhat even uh, counterintuitive in some sense yeah, to get these kinds of references. Um, I don't know how, how much time do I have actually? Okay, then I probably skip here a few parts here yeah, that I wanted to uh, read out. So maybe I just uh, translate that very quickly, yeah, the Appa Brahmsha, okay? So it says something like, um, he who having made firm the mind in here is one that is in the proximity of the Dharma Akshara, yeah? That is to say um, uh, something like, uh, yeah, this is somewhat very technically difficult to translate. You can say something like uh, the unchanging syllable of truth or something like that. It, it clearly refers to the, to the heart center here. Yeah? And this is also how it's used in Kala Chakra literature. Okay? So in that moment, uh, the breath is bound and objects are left aside. And when the couple, the most exceeding in the cessation, that is to say, uh, the highest joy <coughs> and the joy of cessation, yeah? that is to say the third and fourth uh, joy in that respect, uh, is observed, in the middle, one perceives the Dharma Akshara. That is to say, it's a reference to the Sahaja Ananda, yeah? in, in, in his terms. Okay? If through teachings like this one accomplishes clearly, then the mistress of the house of wind is bound motionless. So the uh, Avaduti has been completely purified, yeah? and he remains in that. Hmm? The peak of the Exodus mountain, the lofty terrain, there Shabara made a dwelling place. Those with the five faces cannot cross it, and the best of elephants has, it, has only distant hope. Yeah? There is a, it's a little bit tricky uh, to translate this accurately, but the point is here, when you know the practices, it is very clear that he is describing uh, the process and also making clear that we are talking about um, the result of the practice. Okay? Um, instead, uh, what Amrita Vajra does, um, he is not using any of the expected terminology. Um, nor is he actually telling us in which state of the practice we are. Instead, he explains it by uh, somewhat um, un unexpected <laughs> um, um, uh, references yeah, that uh, seem to be a little bit inconclusive. I mean, I would like to tell you why and how I think it is the case, but unfortunately we do not have time for this. Yeah? Uh, so, mm, um, to wrap it up, um, Munidata explains it exactly um, as I was expecting one uh, would understand this poem. Yeah? So now I try to wrap it up. So why is that uh, relevant? Why did I recite these verses before and what has this to do with modernity? Yeah? So what we can see is Amrit Havashar, he interprets the poem in a way that enforces a system that is not really native um, to, to the song poem. Yeah? such as uh, those that we find in relation to Hevajra, the Samputa, the Sambarodaya traditions, yeah, or what basically also constitutes Narochudru. Hmm? So he is not interested in formalities, and overall he is not very uh, comprehensible, his presentation. So what I conclude from that is that he attempts to reframe the text of a very influential Buddhist author to promote his own doctrine. I mean, it was not very successful, but he didn't really care about that. It was more for him about really to promote uh, something that obviously was very, very, very relevant for his times. And in that sense, um, he is in a very, let's say, good company, because we have always seen that it was part of the Siddha traditions to promote very progressive, uh, progressive spiritual um, uh, ways and means. Yeah? And it is, in some sense, you can say, part uh, of the whole uh, Siddha archetype. Uh, to do so, and he shows, of course, uh, a lot of uh, flexibility in, whoing, in, in, in doing that. And uh, what I conclude is that if you want to take or promote something that is either not common sense or that you take out of its of, out of its original context in order to promote it in a way that it is also be, because it is would be otherwise not be uh, accessible, for instance, to a wider audience, that you can do so when you simply use a rhetoric that allows you to do so. And for this, uh, the Dohas are uh, very suited. And actually, we can see um, that such, such things uh, are also being done nowadays. Um, so my closing remark to, uh, to wrap it up, this idea of charya, of transformation, the verses I was singing um, <clears throat> before, they give you a background, actually, in order to break with the tradition or reinvent the tradition. And this has been done throughout uh, the ages of tantric practice. And that here, our author, uh, Amrita Vajra, 
chooses to interpret something that most likely was not meant uh, in the light of which he interpreted, and he did it nevertheless, it simply shows um, that tradition itself considers it um, meaningful in some sense to promote, uh, to promote new progressive practices and in order to do so, to reinvent the tradition in a certain sense, to reinterpret things, to enforce ideas. Yeah. And it is an historic example that might be interesting for our times because we are faced in times... You remember what uh, Karl Rinpoche said? Yeah? He said, uh, I think, in the beginning of, uh, of his lecture, he said something like that, um, you know, uh, there is good... I mean, when you have a proper teaching and a good reason to do certain things, you can do, most, you can do almost anything. If it is not the case, then not. Yeah? Just to paraphrase it briefly. So in some sense, when we are in a time that... Uh, you know, uh, West and East merges, that uh, practices are revealed, that we're supposed to be secret, and then it's interesting uh, to reflect about what has been done in Buddhist traditions before, and if we maybe can find examples uh, for such things to have happened, if we really want to uh, evaluate uh, these things. And uh, this we can, I think, better do by also having a look what the tradition itself has been done throughout uh, basically its entire existence in Tantra. Uh, so my conclusion here is that to break with tradition is in some sense part of the tradition itself. Uh, I do not know if that statement can hold, um, but it's just something, you know, I threw out there to, uh, to discuss it, yeah? So um, that's, my, that's my contribution for you today. Um, I hope um, it was not too messy, yeah, since like I said, um, I somewhat rearranged everything more or less on the spot. And um, with regard to references of uh, the Dohas, the contents, uh, translations, analysis, editions, and everything that plays along, you know, it's like a very big topic. Uh, uh, I'm happy to provide you any informations or to give you my papers and books and uh, whatever is needed. Yeah? So thank you. Thank you.